Step number three is where we develop up a SMART aim statement, which also includes what we call a measurable stretch goal. So in the first team meeting, the team is to decide exactly what the team is trying to achieve with their project. And they need to agree on the exact problem they're trying to solve and also the goal or aim or objective that they're all working towards. And we record this as an aim statement. And as I said before, your team is just formed, so it's going to take quite a long time to actually work up this SMART aim statement because you need to get everyone on the same page. So your aim statement needs to meet the SMART criteria. It needs to be specific, so it needs to have an objective scope and criteria. It needs to be measurable, so you need to be able to quantify the data. It needs to be both achievable and appropriate, so it can be done and it should be done. It needs to be results orientated. So it needs to have a stretch goal, which is an aspirational goal or target that you want to achieve. And it also needs to be time scheduled. So it needs to have a date that it should be completed about. The important thing with an aim statement is that you do not put a solution in the aim statement. So we don't want to see things like that you to implement a particular policy within a certain time frame. More specifically with the aim statement, it needs to include a time frame so a date or amount of months that it's going to take to do the actual project. It needs to clearly state what you're actually trying to do or what you are trying to accomplish. It needs to focus on a measurable outcome and include what we call a stretch goal, and that's an aspirational goal or aspirational target. So it's a measurable target that's achievable, but it will also be a challenge to obtain. So with David's example, Within 12 months, David will lose 40 kilos. That's his aim statement. The stretch goal here is David losing 40 kilos. He currently weighs 130 kilos, so to lose 40 won't be easy, but it actually can be achieved. So with your aim statement, you just need to do a bit of a double check. So does your aim statement have a time frame? So referring to David's aim statement, it's within 12 months, but he has a time frame. A stretch goal, yes, he has that. He's losing 40 kilos as he currently weighs 130. Criteria is what are you trying to fix? We're trying to fix David's weight. And the scope is the target population, and that is David. So it does meet all that checklist. Now, a bit of a double check. Just make sure the aim statement relates to the original problem. So go and refer to the top left-hand corner of your driver diagram to make sure there is a relationship that you haven't put a solution in your aim statement and that the scope isn't too brief. In other words, can you achieve the project within the time frame that you've set? And you need to make sure that you've got specific measurable stretch goal. So don't use words such as, oh, he's got to use, lose some weight or he's got to lose weight soon. You need to make sure that you're very specific. And as Don Berwick says, some is not a measure, soon is not a time frame and hope is not a plan. So I want you to have a look at this aim statement for a few minutes and just work out what is wrong with this aim statement. So think about, does it have a time frame? Does it have a stretch goal? Does it have criteria? Does it have a scope? And does it not include a solution? So see what you think about this and have a discussion. So what you do with the driver diagram is you put the aim statement to the left-hand side. What I've got here is some examples of aim statements that have been from past participants of the executive CLP and the foundational CLP programs at the CEC. So within one year, 100% of elective surgical patients will be screened for anemia preoperatively. Another aim statement example is within six months, 100% of patients with VRE will be triaged and admitted to a ward bed within four hours. Another one, by the 1st of July, 100% of all autologous products collected by the blood service will meet the patient blood management guidelines. And this particular example has um, an actual date, which is fine. Then there's some other examples here, which are good for you to just review at your leisure. Step four is a literature review. So what you need to do as a team is to divvy up uh, one or two staff members in your team to go off and do a literature review on the topic that you're researching. The reasons why you do this is to make sure that you can identify best practice and also to prevent you from reinventing the wheel. It's a great idea to look at the literature to see what others have done in the past and also look at the 
ideas of measurement. So look to see what they've measured and how they've measured things. And maybe if you measure in the same way, you can actually benchmark with them. What you need to do is decide on the keywords that you'll do for the search. And actually undertaking their search, you can do that in many different ways. You can actually do it on with CAP online or just through Google or Scholar Google. Or also go onto the ACI Innovation Exchange at that URL depicted there. And this is in New South Wales where lots of quality improvement projects are housed. The knowledge of these projects is housed. But also think about going to your hospital library or librarian to try and get them to help you with a literature review. So with David, the example of the keywords that he could search on for his particular problem, like words like causes of obesity, weight loss, calories consumed, calories burnt, BMI, diet and nutrition, and lots of other words you could use in the literature review. And from this, you'll start to find some best practice. So with calories consumed, you'll find by reviewing this journal article, males should consume less than 3,000 calories a day. Also, a BMI of 25 is healthy, considered healthy for a male. So just for five or 10 minutes, what I want you to do is think about your project and develop up an aim statement for your project and use a checklist to remember what are you trying to accomplish, what is your measurable stretch goal, and what is your time frame to accomplish the stretch goal, and don't put a solution in your aim statement. Also write down on the, uh, the literature review, what keywords would you search on, and who in your team would do the literature review. Step number five is where you to flow chart the current process. So on a piece of butcher's paper, you to construct a flow chart thinking how the process flows, particularly the patient, how the patient flows through the system from start to finish. And think in a logical sequence from every step and every decision that's made through that process. And at each step, ask yourself, does this usually happen? But what you've got to remember here is to flow chart the current process, even with its problems and its bottlenecks. Later on, you can actually then flow chart the perfect process that you've actually established when you've made some changes. But this stage, you to flow chart the current process and do it with the entire team, your interdisciplinary project team. So why would you bother actually doing a flow chart? There's a few different reasons. Firstly, so there's a shared understanding by the entire team. So when you have your whole team sit down and flow chart together, they'll all have an understanding of the different parts of the process from the di different disciplines. It's a really, really good way of getting information, intelligence or facts about the problem. If you flow chart, you'll learn a lot about the process. Also, when you flowchart, it's open to criticism of about the current process. What you'll find is when you flowchart that there are areas where there are problems, bottlenecks, and where issues don't flow so well. You'll also understand how complex the process is, and you'll also see where things could be changed or managed differently in the future. And from flowcharting the current process, this is where you'll get ideas about improvements that you could make in the future. You can actually use these symbols. You can use a circle as a begin or end point. The diamond is traditionally used as a decision point and the rectangle as a process step. You can use these symbols or if that's too hard, just use a whole lot of rectangles. So back to David. What we've done here is flow charted David's typical day. So how it really flows is that David wakes up at seven o'clock in the morning and whether it's a weekday or a weekend, he does different things. If it's a weekday for breakfast, he'll have cocoa pops and two pieces of peanut butter and toast and some coffee. Then at 8.30 in the morning, he drives his car to work and his work is five kilometers away. He parks his car, then he takes his lift to level three where his office is and by nine in the morning, he's sitting down at his desk. He sits there all morning and he drinks Coke and coffee and he snacks on chocolate. Then at lunchtime, he'll go out of the office and he'll buy two Big Macs and fries. And then he'll come back to the office and he'll sit all afternoon and he'll then snack on chocolate and Coke. By 5.30 in the afternoon, he drives home. Then in the evening at six o'clock, he watches TV and he has his first beer. Seven o'clock, he has dinner and he usually has takeaway and he'll have another beer. Then he watches more television, has more beer after dinner and then by 11.30, he goes to bed. Then on the weekend, he does um, has more time for breakfast. So he has a breakfast, the usual breakfast of cocoa pops and two pieces of peanut butter toast. But he also has some fried eggs, sausage, and some bacon and some more coffee. 
Then if it's a Saturday, what he'll do is by nine o'clock in the morning, he'll drive his kids to sport and he'll sit down and he'll read the paper as his kids are doing sport. And then as a treat at lunchtime, then he'll go to Kentucky Fried Chicken and he'll get about eight pieces of Kentucky Fried Chicken. Then in the afternoon, he'll sit and watch TV or watch some movies. And then the evening is the same. Then Sundays is a little different. What often he might do is at 10 o'clock in the morning, he might go to the gym. And he usually gets to the gym about once a month. Then for lunch, as a bit of a celebration, he'll have a couple of pizzas from Pizza Hut. And then in the afternoon, he'll watch TV and his evenings are the same. So what does this flowchart really tell you about David? And if we hadn't done this flowchart, we wouldn't really know a lot about him. But now we've got a bit of an understanding that basically he eats a lot and he doesn't do a lot of exercise. So there's two kind of main players here. So after you've done your flowchart on butcher's paper, what you might want to do next is then put it into some software such as PowerPoint so that it looks really neat. And to learn how to flowchart using PowerPoint, just watch this short two and a half minute YouTube clip about using PowerPoint to draw a flowchart. We're now going to do some more hands-on work, but we're going to do it as a group this time. If you're using this presentation as an individual, you can go to the next slide. But if you're using this presentation to educate a group of participants, you'll need to follow these few next few steps. So what we'd like you to do is workshop a problem as a team on the tables that you're sitting at. It's best if we've got approximately five to six participants per table. And also it's advisable to have a quality improvement advisor on your table for the rest of the day to coach your table through the steps. You'll also need to appoint a timekeeper on the table and there to use their smartphone to calculate the timings. The task you've got to do now is on your particular table, each participant is to describe just for two to four minutes the problem that they're trying to solve or their project. And then as a group on each table, decide on one problem or one project that you're going to work on for the rest of the day. When you've decided on the project or the problem that you're going to work on for the rest of the day, you'll need to get the butcher's paper, the textures, the writing pad and a pen, and also use your driver diagram cheat sheet handout to work through the different steps. The first thing you need to do is put your butcher's paper in portrait style and then document the problem that you want to fix in the top left corner. The second step is to document the project team and the project sponsor that you'd like to allocate for this particular problem. And this is to be documented on the bottom left corner of the butcher's paper. The third step is developing up the SMART AIM statement, and that's to be documented on the middle side of the middle of the left side of the butcher's paper. The fourth step is to jot down on another piece of paper on the writing pad, the keywords that you'd search on for the literature review. And the fifth step, using another piece of butcher's paper, is to document the current process. So draw all the different steps and the decisions from start to finish of the current process. After you've finished steps one to three, this is what your driver diagram will be looking like on butcher's paper. Now we're going to talk about step six.